excited to introduce our speaker today, Josh Silver. For those of you who don't know, he is the CEO of Free Press, an organization he co-founded in 2002. Under his guidance, it's become uh, really one of the most respected and thoughtful voices on media reform, both here and across the world. Um, two issues that both Josh and Free Press are closely associated with, among others, are media consolidation uh, and internet policy. I still remember uh, some time ago, a lot of people thought the internet would be something like an automatic solution to media consolidation. Why worry about consolidation when there's the internet, everybody has a voice, why won't it be the golden age of journalism where everybody speaks? It turns out it's not so simple. Some of the principles that made the internet so revolutionary are in jeopardy and the future of journalism itself has really never been so much in doubt. Uh, Josh is here to help us understand how we got here, what's ahead, and perhaps most importantly, what we can all do to help avoid some of the dangers we face. So please join me in giving him a warm welcome, Josh Silver. Hi folks, thanks for coming. Um, does anybody here remember when um, George Bush Sr. was very ill and had the, I think the emperor of Japan over and he, and he um, had to go to the event and I think he, he puked and passed out? That's me today. So I canceled everything today but I knew I had to come here because it's a public talk and I, so if, if that happens, don't freak out. Just stay cool. I will, I will, it, won't, it won't be fatal. Um, be honest, raise your hand if you've heard of free press before today. Interesting. Thanks, Tony. I'll pay, I'll pay you later. Um, so free press is a national nonpartisan advocacy organization that is working to promote media and technology policy in the public interest. And it was started eight years ago, and it's actually kind of uh, bizarre if you think about it. Until we were started, there was no national organization of any real size that was actually advocating on behalf of the public interest on these issues, which is pretty staggering when you consider that, uh, well, first of all, the gravity and implications of the internet that Tony alluded to, to the fact that uh, if you're a despot trying to take over a third world country, the first thing you do is take over the radio and television stations. It is the, the media is the fabric of society through which everyone learns about what's happening uh, and, it's, and it's, it's absolutely central to this thing we call democracy. Now I'll start by saying there is, uh, there's no such thing as deregulated media, so, or the, or internet, and we should be clear about that because there is a mythology pervaded, pervading throughout Washington promoted by industry lobbyists that, you know, hands off healthcare, hands off the environment, hands off the internet, hands off media. Let's let a laissez-faire approach kind of thrive and no regulations and let's just let companies kind of figure it out and things will be better. That is complete BS. I mean, that, that does, that's, it's an inherently regulated system, much in the same way that banks are inherently regulated, the media is inherently regulated. There's only so much broadcast spectrum. There's only so many wires going down the street that deliver internet. There's so much, so much that now today, beyond television and radio broadcasts, there's only so much spectrum to deliver wireless internet content. So there has to be rules of the road and somebody has to decide who the winners are and who the losers are. And that's called regulation and it's, uh, it's inevitable. Now, normally I'll go, I would go into sort of talking about the state of the internet, net neutrality, adoption of, of internet in the United States compared to other countries, the Comcast NBC deal that we just saw, and I will get to those things. But before I do, I think it would be worthwhile for me to just talk a little bit about a realization that I've had over the past two months. Now, it's something that I always knew about. I knew this was looming, and I knew that the problem was acute, but I have never before been more aware than I am today of the following, and that is that something that I'm going to call the elite corporate complex, which is essentially 
the, the uh, combination of the interests of the wealthiest Americans, and when I talk about wealthy, I'm not talking about minor, I'm talking about seriously wealthy, the top 1%. And major corporations that have, at this point, near complete control of political discourse and policy making. And this is a pretty big, I, mean, I think we all kind of know this based a lot upon looking at sort of outcomes of debates that we're seeing in Washington all the time. But this is something that it can't be overstated. Policy making, primarily, and to a lesser degree, discourse, the, the debate, uh, which is led by corporate media is largely controlled by the industries and the wealthiest Americans. We see that in outcomes of crucial policy debates. So for example, net neutrality, which President Obama said he would take a backseat to no one on, we'll talk about it a little bit later, um, was riddled with loopholes. Comcast NBC, as a candidate, he said he was going to oppose deals like that, folded on it. Healthcare, they did some good stuff, but they left out major, major pieces of that, like basic price controls uh, for drug companies, uh, allowing the government to actually negotiate bulk drug sales, things that are such obvious policy um, policies that they should have been able to attain. And the obvious question is, why didn't they? That's why. Um, a, a, a major environmental accord, which was promised um, in 2010, didn't get anywhere because of entrenched industries. So when you're in Washington, like I am too often, you see it every day, where it indeed is K Street. We call K Street the lobbying juggernaut because that's where most of the offices are on K Street in Washington, um, is, is truly supreme. And I think in many ways, it's sort of the end of this romantic vision that many of us have. If you've grown up in the United States, we are taught in elementary school about this wonderful country, which is wonderful, with Founding founders who actually wrote a constitution that was vastly superior to any constitution that had been written up to that point and still has been remarkable in how it stood up over the test of time with really important provisions um, and lots of great improvements. Uh, but really what's going on today is sort of the end, the end of that romantic kind of narrative because that's, that's just not the case. Um, and what we've seen is the way that we've gotten there is if you look back over the arc of history, let's say the last 100 years, in the, in the end of the 19th century, that was sort of the era of the robber barons. And then you had the progressive era. And major changes were initiated, like ending the, the oil and, and, and railroad cartels, the monopolies, um, and, and, and starting on this important track of creating labor rights and a work week and, um, and, and sort of the beginnings of minimum wage. And then we saw again under uh, FDR in the 30s and early 40s, the New Deal. And we saw a whole slew of, of really positive changes. Um, security for, for retired people, major, major important progressive changes. And then we saw it again under Presidents Johnson and Nixon, and a lot of times people don't realize that, but under Presidents Johnson and, Mi and Nixon, the, the Public Broadcasting Act was passed, it created non-commercial public media, you know, the EPA was created, there was a whole a lot of environmental reforms, a lot of really positive changes. And what also happened in the 1970s was that the biggest companies in America had a sort of a final light bulb moment where they realized that these progressive changes, basic changes that help um, protect and ensure the rights of regular Americans were and are a threat to their bottom line, the company's bottom line, pretty basic. And in the quest for profits, they, they understood that they needed to get control of this policy making process because the vast majority of the most important policies that did affect and do affect their bottom line were being and are being made in Washington. So they started building an infrastructure. And that infrastructure is very often incorrectly referred to as a, uh, a right-wing infrastructure, a conservative infrastructure, when in fact it's not, it really isn't. There's, there's conservatives that ideological conservatives that do tend to be manipulated, I think, often into kind of falling in line with it, but it's not, it's not conservative by its nature, it's, it's industry. And they started PR shops and think tanks 
They started hiring former government officials with really golden Rolodexes and unparalleled access. They started creating uh, this sort of labyrinth of supporting institutions that were helping to move and, and shape the news cycle and deter cr cranking out research, which is not always honest, but would support the goals and objectives of those companies. And this, this infrastructure, which I'm calling the elite corporate complex, built and got to a point where since then, in the 1970s, up until now, it is now completely omnipotent. And it cannot be stopped. And I'll talk about that a little bit. Um, I, our organization is, one, is the leading organization, certainly one of the leading organizations on, as Tony said, net neutrality, the idea that uh, internet service providers, cable and phone companies in this country, should not be allowed to indiscriminately block or slow down internet content. Um, and we also have been very engaged in trying to stop the Comcast NBC deal. That infrastructure that I'm describing was able to, throughout the process, particularly around net neutrality, paint people like me and our organization in Washington as this sort of <clears throat> radical Marxist, socialist, sort of revolutionary, uh, bizarre offshoot that was really just, you know, completely off the reservation. And Glenn Beck would have these industry-funded uh, guests on his show and put a picture of me on his chalkboard. And there was, what, what was interesting about it was there was, no, there was no truth in anything that was being said. Like, truth was irrelevant. And that's why I believe very strongly, like Glenn Beck, for example, Again, he's, he's called right wing, but not really. He's really more become sort of people like him because we're like this pawn of the industrial complex. And they called it a government takeover of the internet. They called it the fairness doctrine of the internet. All completely false, but a strong narrative that, 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 makes, that makes people in power nervous, made the Obama administration nervous. Um, and what we saw was, um, an outcome which wasn't favorable. But before we get to that, I want to talk a little bit about the connection between this issue of the internet and the issue of journalism. Because let's say for a moment that we could solve this problem that I'm calling the, cor the elite corporate complex. Let's say that we could minimize their effect and influence in Washington and actually get the people at the front of the line again. The key question is, what does that matter if the American public are being propagandized, being fed sort of superficial soundbite crap on the media and, and are not aware of what's actually going on in the United States, local communities, and abroad? Well, there's a study by the Pew Center for People in the Press. There was one in 2000, there was another in 2009. And that study showed that in 2000, 74% of Americans cite television news as the number one source of news for their, for their, in their day. 74%. Nine years later in 2009, with the rise of the internet, if I were to tell you, and I'm going to, you'll be really surprised because most people think, oh, the internet really kind of replaced a huge chunk of that. That number only went from 74% to 69%. So in the same way that for probably people like Tony and I, it's surprising to hear, oh my gosh, you haven't heard of free press, I can't believe it, I've been in a bubble. We, in, uh, in the advocacy area, people who are in universities like you guys are, you're not aware that your media consumption habits are completely not in line with the rest of the country. Like that, you are in a completely different zone. And the people who are across this country who are being sort of led by the nose to, you know, go protest town hall meetings that are designed to get more affordable health care to people, and they're getting angry, they're getting ginned up, they're watching TV, and they're listening to commercial radio. And so the fundamental question we have to ask is, if, if that's what's happening, if, if, if as Thomas Frank, the author, says, uh, people are being compelled and manipulated into rising up and advocating against their very own interests, which is a serious problem, and we're seeing it over and over and over again. Um, then the question is, why is that happening and how do we fix it? 
And then again, all you have to do is turn on commercial television or commercial radio, and the answer is very clear. There is no real, other than maybe 60 minutes, honestly, I mean, other than like maybe three programs, there is no substantive, thoughtful, critical <laughs> journalism on commercial television and radio. That's not hyperbole, it's, it's, a, it's a fact. And so when that happens, um, you know, we have serious cause for alarm. In the last 10 years, there's been a 31% decrease in the number of journalists who are covering state houses and, and, and reporting on what's happening in state legislatures. We are seeing as a well-documented freefall in journalism jobs as classified ads go to Craigslist, revenue goes down in newspapers, newspapers get smaller and smaller, and there's less and less reporting. Why does that matter? Newspapers constitute the vast majority of actual original reporting in communities across the country. There's a very real possibility that in a few years, we really will have an even, a, 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 we're getting close to it, but a, a real crisis in journalism. Like many communities where there's no, literally no eyes and ears for the, American, for the public on most, on crucial issues like local corruption, local government. And so, I'm going to read you a quote, this guy David Simon, who did the TV show The Wire, he was testifying in front of Congress a couple years, about a year and a half ago, and he said to Congress, he said, the, uh, regarding this issue, he said, the next 10 to 15 years will be halcyon days for local corruption. It's going to be a great time to be a corrupt politician. And we're finding that more and more, that this, uh, this crisis of journalism is acute and there's not a whole lot of obvious solutions. Now, you may have heard, raise your hand, again, be honest, raise your hand if you've heard of any of the following. Voices of San Diego, the Bay Area News Network, Min Post, the Texas Tribune, has anybody heard of these? I'm glad I asked. These are innovative online news sites that are popping up around the country where they're basically running on small, relatively small budgets between say half a million and two million dollars a year. And they actually are hiring reporters. They're only online, so their distribution costs are extremely low. And they are actually doing a solid local reporting. Now, people who are thinking about this problem of journalism, a lot of them are pointing to these examples as, well, this is the future. What they're missing is that while these are great little ventures and they're doing good work, I say little because they are compared to the budget, say, of a real you know, blue chip media property that are small. It takes three things for those, for those projects to work. One, you have to have a generous uh, philanthropist. Two, you have to have a strong CEO or executive. And three, you have to have a strong editor. And the problem is, is that in about, I'm gonna hazard a guess, 98, 90%, 99% of communities around the country, you just don't have those three skill sets or, or resources all aligned and ready to create a, a project like the Voices of San Diego. I do recommend after this talk, when you have a chance, take a look. Look at, look at the Bay Area News Network up in San Francisco. Look at the Voices of San Diego. Um, they are an important part of the future, but they have limitations. So um, that brings us to the internet. Now, the internet, I think you guys understand better than most, because we're here in Stanford, what the potential of the internet really is. I mean, the internet is going to allow the possibility that any website could act as a television network, a radio network. It's a, it's a complete game changer for the access and distribution of all media content. And the potential, particularly the fact that it's two-way, cannot be overstated. It is, it is huge. It's the biggest I would venture that it is the biggest uh, communications breakthrough in modern history. And there's been four. There was radio in the 1920s, there was TV in the 1950s, there was cable TV in the 1980s, and each time, and of course there was internet in the last 20 years, or 40 years, but for consumers, 20 years. Uh, but each time one of these technologies emerged, there was 
this big clarion call about how this is going to be the complete game changer. This is the technology that's going to give everybody a voice. This is the technology that we are going to see the radical increase in the ability of people to communicate with each other and, and speak and hear. And each time, quite quickly, relatively quickly, a set of commercial interests realized the huge profit-making potential of this new technology and to a large degree consolidated control of it so that it very quickly became very difficult to get a broadcast license for radio. Try to get a broadcast license in Stanford, if you don't believe me. Um, on television, we saw the emergence, a natural triopoly, I don't know if that's a word, of three networks, NBC, CBS, and, and, and uh, ABC. And the kind of dream of this television where anybody could have their own TV station for a, a variety of reasons, including regulatory but also economic, didn't pan out. Cable, this is a great one. Cable comes along, a lot of people don't realize, cable was invented in the 1970s, it's very recent. And when it came out, that was the biggie. That was like, check it out, you got this wire that goes into your house and you can get hundreds, even thousands of, of channels on your TV. This is the complete game changer. This is everything. Now, I don't have to tell you, like Al Gore started Current TV, former vice president, really well connected, great Rolodex, tons of money that he could get access to. He was unable to get Current TV sufficiently carried on Comcast, Time Warner Cable, and other major Cox, other major cable companies because of the cartel that through policy making, those companies, those cable companies were able to create and box out whomever they wanted to box out for economic advantage. So instead of having an ability to get a meaningful amount of, of, of independent voices on cable TV, uh, the only way you do it is a few local programmers can do that because of um, some old laws that are getting overturned now. Uh, or you are part of a conglomerate like ABC, Disney or CBS or NBC and you can actually negotiate and there's lots of wheelings, wheeling and dealing. If you, if you Comcast, you can have ESPN, but if you, this is Disney talking, you can have ESPN because everyone needs to have ESPN, but if you, if you carry ESPN, you, ne you have to carry two other ESPN channels and you have to carry these other 10 channels and quickly the cable dial filled up and people were boxed out. So <clears throat> along comes the internet and this is the big game changer. This is a, this is a platform developed here that was, is now 41, 42 years old. It's naturally a dumb network. It's naturally just a, you know, a, a, a platform where everything kind of moves through it in an agnostic way. It doesn't matter if you're sending it or you're sending it or you're sending it. It's going to move across that platform at the same speed. Now, of course, there's differences in how fast you download it. But I'm talking about uploading and moving across the network. Always parity, and, um, and you don't have to pay a premium um, for, for that privilege. Now, thanks to bad decisions by the Bush FCC in 2005, we saw something, one of the quietest kind of disasters in internet policy, uh, arguably the worst disaster ever, which was in 2005, and since we're at law school, I'm gonna, can I get a little wonky on you? Just a little? So in 2005, nobody really said yes, but I'm gonna do it. Um, there, was a, there was a rule at the FCC, which was very old, called common carriage. You probably, some of you are nodding your heads and you know about it. But it was this principle that said, uh, that, that regulated phone companies, that basically said, any American can do, it goes all the way back to the 1934 Telecommunications Act. Any person can do whatever they want with their phone line, right? The phone line is this copper wire, it goes into your house, you do whatever you want with it. You're, we're not gonna tell you what you can or can't do. And further, laws compelled those phone companies to share those wires with other competitors at a reasonable wholesale cost. Now this is a, again, I'm getting wonky, but stay with me, because it's a good aha moment. In the 1990s, some of you will recall that when dial-up internet service was introduced, there was this massive rush of competition. 
And there'd be all these little companies, little local. Do you guys all remember like in the newspaper, dial up internet? Now that it's 2011, I used to be, have people be like, yeah, I remember. And now everyone's like, I'm not sure. But you, there was like 10, 20 providers in many communities, $9.99 a month for your dial up. You had all these choices. And it was because of laws that said these little companies that are offering service have to be allowed access to that copper wire going into people's homes at a reasonable wholesale cost. 2005, the cable companies had been for a few years delivering high-speed internet. They figured out, cable companies figured out how to get high-speed internet through a coaxial cable and deliver, deliver service. So the phone company, this is the, and here's Washington Corruption 101. Phone companies go into the FCC, Federal Communications Commission, and say, Cable companies are offering high-speed internet, but they're not compelled by any laws to share those wires with other competitors, but we are. So you, FCC, should take away this rule that says we have to share our wires, because it's not fair. They don't have to. Now, a sane policy-making apparatus that actually has your interests in mind, the outcome of that, the, the answer to that question is very obvious. You're right, phone companies and we are going to compel the cable companies to also share their wires so that we have a robust competitive market. We are aware that no home has more than two wires going into it, a copper phone wire and some have a cable wire. That's not competition. We are going to have to force competition. That's the way, that's what we did with oil. It's what we did with railroads. It's what we've done with electricity. It's what we did with Bell when we, the antitrust rule that broke up AT&T in the 1980s. This is just smart policy. Instead, the Bush FCC did the opposite. And in, a, in the strike of a pen, we saw the creation of a government-sanctioned duopoly in internet content, or internet providers in this country. So today, in 97% of communities, you have one or two, or sometimes no, uh, providers, but two or less. In 3% of the United States, because of local nuances, you could have three or four. But that's rare. So suddenly, we have this market where it's not competitive, and we start to fall. In the last 10 years, the United States went from fourth to 22nd internationally in broadband adoption. The reason is that the phone and cable companies have very little incentive to increase the speed of their networks, drive down costs, compete for customers. And what we're seeing is we are now behind Estonia in broadband speed and adoption. This is a huge problem because what we're finding is the dividing line between those who have internet at home, broadband internet at home, and those who do not are mostly along financial economic lines, poor people, and rural because there's not enough choices and it's expensive in rural places. So um, along comes President Obama. Uh, actually, candidate, candidate Obama, and he and he's great. He says all the right things. He says, "I'm going to take a backseat to no one on net neutrality," as I said earlier. We're excited. We're like, "This is great." He goes on to say, in another quote, "I strongly favor diversity of ownership of outlets, media outlets, and protection against the excessive concentration of power in the hands of any one corporation, interest, or small group." when he was referring to the possibility of more media consolidation. We were excited. We are like, this is great. So he comes into office. He appoints this guy, Julius Janikowski, to head the Federal Communications Commission. And very quickly, things started to go wrong. The FCC came out with a national broadband plan, and there was literally no discussion at all about broadband competition. What I just told you about, the single most important element to a strong public interest minded broadband policy, they wouldn't even talk about it. Why? Because that is the ultimate third rail issue for Comcast, Verizon, AT&T. And if that's the case for those companies, it, if it's a third rail, rail issue for them, it's a third rail issue for anyone in power, whether it's Republican or Democrat. Because there is a calculus made that if you piss off those companies, you are going to have such incredible uh, firepower in the way of electoral um, you know, campaign contributions and the infrastructure I mentioned being pointed against you that you're going to get driven out of office, you're gonna get, you know, you're gonna get beat. Now, 
Who here has been following Citizens United, the Supreme Court case? Anybody been paying attention to that? <coughs> Citizens United happened uh, about, about a year ago, a little, just a few days more than a year ago. And it was a ruling by the Supreme Court that said that the government uh, cannot limit anyone's right to corporations mainly, corporations' right to uh, spend money on political ads, <laughs> explicitly calling for the election or defeat of candidates. So what we're starting to see right now, and, and I've kind of put this out of order, so forgive me, but what we're starting to see is that undergirds this omnipotent power by the, the Bells and the, and the cable companies. These guys, lobbyists, are basically doing what was reserved for like mafia thugs, and now they're doing it and it's legal. So they go into congressional members' offices in Washington, and they basically say, legally, you either vote with us on net neutrality or sign this letter or whatever, or we're gonna spend tens, hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars to, on your opponent, to support your opponent and get you out of office. This is a, this is a, a mind-boggling concept when you consider that the dollars that these companies have are so massive. These companies that make uh, billions with a B in profits every year, how much expense is it really for them to spend 30, 40 million dollars a year? It's why the phone and cable companies, the telecommunications industry, is second only to the pharmaceutical industry in Washington lobbying. Most people don't realize that. We're up against the second largest lobby in Washington. So, the net neutrality rule is riddled with loopholes. It pretty much is a free-for-all for wireless connections. So anybody who uses a PDA or a cell phone, there are no protections for you any longer uh, that would prevent those phone companies from blocking or degrading content indiscriminately. That's gone. On the wireline, uh, fixed wire that goes into your home or business, there are some protections, but they're riddled with loopholes. Comcast NBC, it came along a month later. We were, as I said, assured that, that, that they would stop that. They never even really tried. Conditions were applied to the deal. What I mean by conditions are the Department of Justice and the Federal Communications Commission did make a set of rules of the road that said, Comcast, if you take over NBC, you have to do, you know, you can't do this, you can't do that, you can't do this. But what they didn't tell you is that those all sunset, they go away after seven years. Seven years is not that long for Comcast to do what they're planning to do. They've admitted it in trade shows and places where they, they uh, you know, they're, some of their executives were maybe talking a little bit out of school. But their plan is to basically turn the internet into something more like cable TV, where they control the user experience and they can actually get anyone who, prov who is providing high bandwidth applications like high definition video has to pay them an extra premium to ensure that it's going to be delivered quickly and clearly to your audience, to the Comcast customer base. This is a big deal when you consider that Comcast is the nation's largest cable company and they're the largest internet company. So the place where this leaves us in wrapping up, um, I believe, that at this point there are these two major issues that are facing this country and if we don't prioritize them both in terms of activism study legal study philanthropy if we don't start to actually prioritize the elite corporate complex that controls washington and the need to create a robust fourth estate and an open and accessible internet to create an informed population and not a bunch of lemmings, that if we don't do that, we are going to see every issue we care about lose. And that's inevitable. And it's a real wake-up call for people because, you know, some people say, oh, well, that's BS. I don't believe it. That's, you know, you're the your chicken little and the sky's falling. <laughs> if you're in Washington and you're actually watching the, this, the, the fate of each of these issues every day, it's really sad and scary. I come home from my trips to Washington and I literally am like shaken at watching how every basic public interest minded um, proposal just gets destroyed by this, this, this juggernaut. 
I mean, we have a greater disparity in wealth in this country than we've had since before the Great Depression. There is a certain point. All you have to do is drive across the country, get out of this bubble. I live in a bubble too, but get out of your bubble. Look at the country. It's, 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 it's terrifyingly poor. And there's a basic math, which is like, if you have this, this sort of oligarchy class that has that much money, that are making five, 10, 15, 20 billion dollars a year, and oh, by the way, the, the uh, elite corporate complex is protecting like those hedge fund managers, 15% tax loophole, so they pay 15% while we pay 30. At a certain point, the math doesn't add up. At a certain point, we've seen it with every empire for the last, you know, for as, as long as history has been documented. You can't consolidate wealth to that degree and have a viable, functional, political, and economic system. So we're, we are in a, a, a crisis that I dare say most people overlook and don't understand the magnitude of. And um, I think I'm gonna leave it at that. That's about 30 minutes. Um, and open it up for questions. Go ahead. Okay, two comments and questions. First, on the well, 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 you want to use the microphone so that we uh, get it recorded. Let me bring it out to you. I actually think get, taking that, that spectrum away from, so it's break it into two parts. Taking it away from broadcasters is a good thing because they don't need it after digital transition. They're just sitting on it. Um, where it goes, let's talk about where it goes. And it's something I actually omitted from my talk, so I thank you because you just reminded me of an important part of the talk that I uh, should include. When we look at the, the dearth of journalism and what's going to fill the void, there is a, there is a fact that once you do your homework, you realize that there's really only one reliable way forward that economically makes sense and really has great promise, in my opinion. And that is public broadcasting and public media. If you look at the rest of the world, here's a staggering statistic. We spend roughly $1.50 per person per year on public media, the entirety of public television and radio and other outlets that actually get money from that fund, Corporation for Public Broadcasting. England is $80, Denmark is over $100. And when you look at the economics and the way the economics of commercial journalism are failing, you realize that the solution is you need a way to subsidize it. So then the question is, A, is there a role for government in funding journalism? A lot of people have a knee-jerk reaction, I shouldn't do that. That doesn't make, that's not, that's not legit. The fact is, two studies have been done in the last couple of years that reinforce unassailably that indeed government can have a hand in funding journalism. The Economist magazine, not exactly a far left crazy liberal bastion of, of information, pretty mainstream, does an annual survey of the healthiest democracies in the world and by no coincidence the top 10 countries that they deem, and of course, no surprise, they tend to be Scandinavia, other parts of Europe, the healthiest democracies have among the highest funded per capita public media systems. 
Another study by the New York University, uh, Professor Rod Benson just came out like last week, and he studied 14 countries ranging from $30 to $134 per capita funding of public media and found that all of them have a higher level of public service content, critical journalism, and government accountability reporting. So what that means is, and I'm getting to your spectrum point because I think the auction of spectrum should go into a public media trust fund, that if you expand public media in the United States, five things need to happen. Number one, you have to actually get it away from the appropriations process, which is inherently riddled with political kind of shenanigans. So it has to be an automatic independent mechanism like spectrum allocation. So spectrum auctions, money just goes into it. Politicians don't have a say. Number two, you have to increase the firewall between politics and public broadcasting. So that, uh, that, that in addition to that, you do things like better ombudsman role, you change the way the Corporation for Public Broadcasting's board is appointed. You actually take measures to really make sure that government money is not going into journalism that can be manipulated. Three, you diversify the audience and content of public media, make it more focused on young people, on people of color, and really try to diversify age, class, race. Uh, four, you have to broaden the definition of what is public media and include these local online news sites I mentioned, um, innovative, just innovative news sites around here in Stanford, a student newspaper. I, I think it should be a really broad range of eligible outlets, um, public uh, community television stations, and then you have a local board of some sort that actually makes the decisions as to how that money is allocated in a democratic way. And the fifth is there needs to be a major change in how public media is structured and run. Because the problem is, is the best, there's a guy named Bill Kling who runs American Public Media, he's great, and he talks about this a lot. The best stations, media stations in the country, too often um, are, 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 not, um, are not the public media ones. The, the, the best executives go into the commercial space because it pays so much more. And the, uh, the non-commercial radio and television stations tend to be run by people who might not be as good. They tend to be a faulty structure where the, the radio station is owned by Stanford, for example, but the leadership of Stanford, I'm, I'm not picking on Stanford, it might not be true, but uh, the, the leadership of the university is not really tuned into what the needs of the radio station are and what it means to, to run a radio station. There's a good argument for actually taking NPR affiliate stations out of academic institutions and make them owned by a nonprofit sort of community entity of some sort, but something that is going to be more conducive to being well run. Um, but that's a long way of answering the fact that those spectrum allocate the spectrum auctions, um, we have to stop just throwing the money from spectrum auctions into the general budget to pay for war and you know bad, poorly prioritized spending. Other questions? Back there to your. I'm one of those journalists that you talk about that's sort of moved on to other things. I was with the Los Angeles Times for many, many years. And um, I would be interested in hearing you talk some about the point you made in the beginning that people are not, are voting against their own interests, that they're not particularly interested in reading the kinds or listening or watching the kinds of things that might encourage them to vote for their own interests. Yeah. Um, public radio and public television aside, we had you know, many discussions about why people don't read foreign news unless something's happening in Egypt or Afghanistan or something like that. Then you can multiply that in terms of state budget and all kinds of other boring, allegedly boring subjects. How do you change that? And I don't think it's just yeah. free or cable access or any of that. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I, I think there's three dynamics happening in our society that should be mentioned that play into this. Uh, the world is so much more complicated than it used to be. I mean, a hundred years ago, you, or maybe a little less, I mean, a lot of people, like, all they had to know was, like, how to, like, take apart their tractor and put it back together again, right? I mean, there's just, there was no, you just didn't even have, you know, the inputs. It was just... The life as a, as a human mammal was just so much simpler and so much, so, so fewer inputs. 
which is which is the irony where even though I'm Mr. Affordable, open, ubiquitous internet, I just I'm gonna say I just canceled my Facebook page. I just shut it down, and I shut down my Twitter, and I shut shut it, I shut down my LinkedIn, because I think it's actually important that you kind of like not go overboard because we're creating this ADD society that's sort of overkill. But that's not really to your question. So number one is people, people are completely overwhelmed by information. Number two, I think that because of the polarization the, the, the really brought by the failure of our current media system, people don't agree on basic facts. So if you watch Fox News, you believe that there are an entirely different set of basic facts about the world than if you watch MSNBC. And so the starting point at for, you know, what is the state of the world, what's wrong, and what should be fixed or not fixed is dramatically different depending on the, on the news you consume. And it's, it's making it difficult for anybody to agree on anything as, as the starting point for a discussion. I, I can tell you have a, a, a thought about that. I'd like to hear it. You're talking about unringing the bell, and I'm not sure that, I'm, yeah. not, I'm not sure you can unring the bell on some of this stuff. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, I, I, I hear that. And then, but the third thing is, I think, is, is unringable, which is, um, I think because of the failure of public education, the, the, the poor funding and the, and the slow demise of public education, people, Americans are decreasingly, in my view, able to engage in basic critical thinking. And in fact, they don't even have ba a basic sense of civics, sort of a, base, a basic framework of the history of our country, for example. And that's another challenge, which could be remedied with, with progressive policy, but that's a long haul fix. Um, but I would submit to you that if we had commercial television, I shouldn't, I'm sorry, not commercial, television of any sort that was more where you found it more ubiquitous to come across thoughtful, intelligent reporting, um, likewise on radio, that you would have the, the increase of a more informed, more enlightened electorate. I mean, where, do you think anybody could have found in the past year a thoughtful story on commercial television or radio about Egypt before the, the protests erupt, erupted? I would hazard a guess, we know that the Cairo bureaus for the networks were closed long ago. That there was not a single substantive story about the politics or history or state of Egypt on any commercial television or radio in this country for the past year at least. That's a problem. If you go, and public television can't afford to do it, so they don't. If you go to England and you turn on the BBC, you can be sure they've reported on Egypt many times over the past year. And people see that. That's the number one source of news in that country. They learn. They're more engaged. We have stupid shouting heads, like, you know, as these companies go to cut costs, they don't do reporting. That's too expensive. They just put people with opinions on blathering about American politics. So I really enjoyed your talk, and I'm very sympathetic to many of the points you make. Um, but I think it's kind of unfortunate that you canceled your Facebook and your LinkedIn and your Twitter, because I think if, if we, if our only hope is to, you know, get more money for public broadcasting, yeah. I feel like the arrows are pointing in the wrong direction there. And I, I guess the, the counter thing, I mean, we are in a time where everyone's thinking about Egypt, everybody's thinking about Tunisia, everybody's talking about Iran, and I guess I just wanted to get your take on. You know, the Silicon Valley counter argument to a lot of the stuff that's happening, the cynical things happening with our media and consolidation and all of that, is the optimism that's coming out of all this technological innovation. And I watch a lot of alternative television through the internet, and there's amazing sources. Now, I agree with you, 99% of people aren't out there watching some of these streams. Right. But I feel like there's such an incredible diversity of sources of information now, yeah. and, uh, and that's something we've never had before. And it's not just a thousand channels, it's a million channels, it's a billion channels, and you can get information from anywhere. And I guess, does that provide any source of optimism for you? It, I understand about the information overload, but it is a powerful counter-argument to some of this. Yeah, and, I, and it's funny, I agree with you. You're, 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 you're absolutely right. And I shouldn't have admitted that I closed down my Facebook, but it's for me, it's just, I'm so busy that I just, I, I'm overloaded and my wife's obsessed with Facebook, so I just, I've, I've delegated. But um, uh, I think the problem is, is that while you're absolutely correct, 
um, about your point about diverse outlets on the internet and how you can get far more than you ever could. It gets to my talk about earlier about the wonder of the internet. I think there's two factors to keep in mind. Number one, the long-term policy implications of things like losing net neutrality protections. And what is that going to do for the future of those kinds of feeds that you're getting? And, and are they going to suffer as a result? Time will tell. Um, but based upon the history of the major technological revolutions in, in, in communications infrastructure, there is cause for alarm. There's cause to believe that the kinds of, uh, the kinds of warnings issued by net neutrality proponents are, are valid. The second is, though, is, is more about sort of like the reality check of looking at how this country politically is going to hell in a handbasket. And, 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 and I think somewhat quickly. And so, and, and the kind of madness that we've seen around the, the way that the, 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 the population is being turned against each other, and that there's this false illusion of right versus left, and that and there's this very polarized, angry discourse that's fed by television and radio. And so despite the fact that you're right about the internet, again, the vast majority of Americans, that's not where they're going. And, and I don't believe that television will go below 50% as the number one source of news and information for people for a very long, long time. Because of very old sort of consumption habits that will take, to, will take a good deal of time. And I'm worried about our country in the interim, if that makes sense. But your point is well taken, and I probably will refire up my Facebook account at some point. Uh, what, how much time do we have left, Tony? Uh, we have about five minutes left. OK. Um, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I just have uh, two uh, questions. One uh, really quick one. I always uh, wanted the answer that you might be able to, to tell me. Uh, on one of these nerves, one of my favorite channels is C-SPAN. I know that your organization, Dr. Communicators, for example, and they're funded entirely by the cable and satellite industry, yet they strike me as one of, uh, perhaps, you know, kind of by the way they make, create their programming, one of the least partisan, uh, you know, they don't tend to have a lot of you know, their own talking heads on. I was curious as to, how they don't have, if you, if you think that they've been corrupted by the, the cable and satellite industry or what's going on with that. So that's well, my, let, me, let me answer that and you can ask the follow-up. Okay. No, I mean, C-SPAN, first of all, I hope that you, you don't ever admit that you love C-SPAN like if you're dating. That, <laughs> that's a disaster. I've tried that. Um, but, uh, so be careful. I, I, um, C-SPAN's great. I think it's a great public service. It's, it, was, it, was, it was created as kind of the quid pro quo when the cable industry was given the rights to lay coaxial cable all around the country. It came with the condition that said, you've got to run this. I, so I don't want this to be misconstrued as a criticism of C-SPAN. Um, I think it's an important part of, of our system. However, it's also just the myopic debate between you know, politicians in Washington. And the, the big fundamental problem is both parties have been largely corrupted by money in politics and, and industry lobbyists. They do their bidding constantly. And so the range of debate that you're seeing in, in, in Washington on C-SPAN is sort of this, when in fact the real debate's out here. Uh, that doesn't mean C-SPAN's a problem or should be changed. I think it's great, but there needs to be so much more to supplement it. What's your second question? All right, so uh, that was a, a much uh, wonkier question, probably. Um, so you know, I, you agree that we, most people right now, they have Comcast or, or AT&T, probably, for the like, broadband internet. Uh, of course, there are other technologies of like internet over uh, power line and uh, fixed wireless so forth that haven't really come into to their own, perhaps in part because, uh, you know, so far, Comcast hasn't Everybody over, though uh, they might. And I'm curious, as long as the the backbone of the internet, which involves many more companies than just AT&T and Verizon, that was most of which most people have probably never heard of, as long as those companies aren't discriminating uh, and they don't have content arms and so forth, it should still be possible for local internet providers to start up using alternate technologies like fixed wireless and so forth that could fill the gap uh, if and when Comcast. Uh, Messes things up. I'm just yes and no. I mean, you are getting wonky, and I, I, I'm sorry to everybody else, but uh, 
the, there's a couple there's a couple issues there. Uh, first of all, the the backbone, as it's called, so the connections that go between Stanford and San Francisco, or San Francisco and L.A. Um, there is actually a lack of public interest protections on those. So if you wanted to start a new company that needed to tie into that backbone to do last mile, to offer service to people, whether wireless or wired, you're going to have to pay a, a lot of money for, for that. And there's already problems because of poor regulation. You may have heard this gets really wonky, but very recently Comcast got into a nitpick with a company called Level 3, which is a backbone company, because of uh, level three took on Netflix's on uh, on demand streaming video, and Comcast said, "You know what? If you guys level three are going to be delivering Netflix streaming video, you've got to pay us a bunch more than you currently are." And there's this problem. Of course, Comcast is huge. They are trying to offer their on demand services over Netflix's. Netflix is their competitor. That's a tr that's a complicated uh, story. Um, but the 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 main the main point is. Broadband over power lines does not work. That's why you never see it. Broadband over satellite is slow. And the only really fast uh, proven broadband is cable, which is, is, the, is, is the looming monopoly, and, uh, and, and fiber, which the phone, and, uh, phone companies used to have plans to deploy fiber across the country. They've canceled all of them. And you're pointing to something that, that Professor Susan Crawford has been talking about a lot, a lot lately, which is the looming, and maybe I'll close with this because it's wonky, but it's fascinating. The looming cable monopoly. The fact is, is that right now we have two providers in 97% of markets, but soon as broadband needs increase, cable coaxial internet service is the only physical infrastructure that will be fast enough to reliably deliver large amounts of high definition video. DSL is going to be too slow in a matter of years. The phone companies know it, and they know that if they were to deploy fiber, that because cable already has their entire infrastructure in place, that cable has such a competitive advantage without having to build out all this capital infrastructure, that cable will always be able to undercut them in price and beat them. So the phone companies have said, all right, forget it. It's not gonna make sense for us to lay fiber. We're gonna seed the broadband, the, the landline broadband market to the cable industry, we are going to be dominating the wireless space. And that's why the net neutrality rule that was recently passed has this giant loophole around wireless. It's because cable, uh, excuse me, phone companies like AT&T and Verizon own Washington. They have incredible power there. And they made sure that those laws were written, the FCC rules were written in such a way that they will be able to discriminate content on wireless connections and be able to kind of run the show. And they've already started. Sprint PPCS, just a couple weeks after the net neutrality ruling, announced a product where their, their PDA phones will only be able to download certain kinds of uh, internet uh, video providers, but not others. Um, you want one quick last thing? Quick follow-up. Quick. The, the uh, wireless companies, the internet companies, pressing the enjoyment and the benefits of being common carriers of these and insulation from liability Content that's carried, right? Yeah. But common carriers have to deliver indiscriminately things. Wouldn't the problem that we're talking about here with respect to net neutrality be solved simply if, we, if Comcast and its yep. brethren were classified as common carriers in the discussion? Yep, absolutely. Competition will, will fix 90% of the problem. And competition is what Washington, both parties, is absolutely they're unwilling to even touch. And until we deal with this problem of money in politics, we're not going to see a solution. I'd urge you guys to go to our huge conference. It happens every three years, so it's not frequent, but it's really amazing. Unfortunately, it's in Boston this year, April 8th, 9th, and 10th. I know, I'm sorry, there's a direct. Um, but it's pretty amazing, 3,000 people all together talking about media, technology, internet, journalism, uh, public media. It's a great show. Go to freepress.net, sign up, become an e-activist. It's free, it takes a couple minutes. Thanks for having me. Thank you very much.